So welcome and good afternoon from Germany to this online webinar of our Bilk Webucation series. Um, my name is Johannes Winkel. I'm the secretary of the Bilk Department Teaching and Education. And I would like to give you a few details about today's webinar before we start with the lecture of Dr. Mireia Lugas from Barcelona, Spain. The BILK webinars are an ongoing rolling online teaching sequence featuring international renowned BILK speakers covering different topics of today's hand search. You will find all upcoming BILK webinars of the BILK on the BILK website or on our social media channels like Instagram, Facebook or LinkedIn. After today's lecture, we will have a 15 minutes question and answer section. The questions can be only submitted through the online chat and you will be collected or they will be collected by myself after the talk and I will forward them to Mireia Esplugas and she will answer them live after her lecture. This webinar is live, but will be also recorded. So we will upload it for you to review it on our BILG webpage and also on Mireia's YouTube channel. So you can check out the session later on again. Every participant will get a certificate of attendance. And right after the webinar, there will be a small questionnaire popping up on your screens, asking for some feedback, which will be very important for us to improve the future webucation series. The next BILG webinar will be given next week already on Tuesday, the 19th of May at 6 p.m. Central European time featuring Dr. Phil Grief from Dublin in Ireland. And he will talk about fractures of the phalanx and metacarpal bones in very complex cases. Um, all forthcoming BILG webinars are announced on the BILG website and on the social media channels of the BILG under the BILG webpage, BILG.com, or also under the BILG group name. You may also find any general information on our BILG webpage. Now, I would like to quickly introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Mireia Esplugas from Barcelona in Spain. Mireia is an internationally well-known consultant and hand surgeon at the Kaplan Institute in Barcelona. She is a member of the European Board in Hand Surgery since 2005. She was associated editor in the Spanish Hand Surgery Society Journal from 2016 to 2019. She's a member of the FESH social media committee since 2017 and a member in several other international societies, such as the International Risk Arthroscopy Society. Mireia joined the BILG in 2019 as a full member and her today's talk will feature distal radius anatomy and biomechanics, including ligaments, vessels, kinematics and kinetics. We are looking forward to a very exciting lecture, Mireia, and I would like to hand over the stage to you now. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's an honor and pleasure to have you here. The stage is yours. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. First, I would like to thank the big group to allow me to share with all of you this presentation. Thanks. Today's session will be covering the distal radius anatomic and biomechanical concepts which can help us to plan the distal radius fracture treatment. Let me first introduce the agenda for this presentation. We will divide this presentation in three parts. During the first one, we will be covering all the inputs of the distal radius anatomy, while in the second part, we will focus on distal radius biomechanics just before finishing the presentation with some conclusions and important insights. As I just introduced, we will be starting with some distal radius anatomic concepts that can help us to better plan and socially solve a distal radius fracture. The third and the last anatomical concepts that I wanted to talk to you about 
is the distal radius vascular anatomy. Okay. In this first section, we will focus on distal radius bone and we will cover the metaphysis and the joint surface architectures. I would like to present to you six important anatomical aspects of the distal radius metaphysis, which can influence our surgical technique and the postoperative outcome. First, I am convinced that you have all already heard about the watershed line. It corresponds to the lineal area where the tendon flexors are the nearest to the bone during wrist extension. This is the watershed line area. Some types of distal radius fractures can absolutely distort its relief and render it absolutely unrecognizable. Nevertheless, if we are able to identify it, and we insert the distal rim of our volar plate two millimeters proximal to this line relief, we will ensure the flexor tendons protection. The second anatomical aspect is that at the ends of the watershed line, we can find two tubercles, the radial and the lunate one, which define a fossa between them. Both tubercles are sometimes easier to identify than the watershed line itself. Their palpation can help us to correctly reduce the fracture when the watershed line is difficult to identify. Their importance lies in the fact that the flexor polythes longus tendon runs into the interfossa sulcus, where it is separated from the bone about four or five millimeters. If we insert a straight volar plate, we will automatically decrease the volume of the intersulcus fossa, and the flexor polythes longus tendon can be damaged. Although we had been cautious and inserted the plate proximal to the watershed line. That is the reason why you can find on the market some plates specifically shaped to perfectly adapt to the reliefs of the radial and lunate tubercles. To preserve this FPL sleep area volume. Let's focus now on the third important anatomical topic, which is the volar rim lunate tubercle. This tubercle protrudes volarly and flies above the radius diaphysis like a balcony of a building. This specific anatomical disposition weakens it and facilitates its fracture, which will always be a displaced fracture. Why? Because the extremely robust short radiolunate ligament that you see there in yellow color inserts on this volar rim of the lunate tubercle. And if this is a competent ligament, it will maintain the bone fragment volar and distally displaced. This bone deformity will induce a slight adaptative lunate bone dizzy. We will come back later on this very important radiocarpal stabilizing ligament. The fourth anatomical concept that I would like to comment to you is that the first four sheets of the dorsal extensor retinaculum insert over the dorsal aspect of the distal radius metaphysis. So, if the volar plate screws are too long and they protrude into the sheet floors 
and compromise. They will compromise the wrist extension, the thumb function, and the trifalangial finger flexion. The wrist extension, the thumb flexion for the third the compartment, and the trifalangial finger flexion for the fourth compartment. The, the skyline fluoroscopic view has always been recognized to be useful to ensure that the screw's lengths are optimum. Nevertheless, I personally prefer the peroperative ultrasound study performed with the anesthesiologist ultrasound um, equipment. Ultrasounds perfectly and easily detect any screw invasion in the dorsal extender sheet and this is i think it's much more easy with the ultrasound than with the skyline fluoroscopic which depends on the angle of your screws and your plate and it depends on these angles to uh, check well or not the, the length of the screws the fifth anatomical detail that I would like to share with you is that the superficial belly of the pronator quadratus muscle inserts on the volar aspect of the distal radius. And this is a very important muscle to consider. It is relaxed in forearm pronation, while it is tightened in forearm supination. So, a useful tip to facilitate its reattachment after inserting the plate is to tighten the sutures while the forearm is in pronation because it is relaxed and it will be easier. And why should we always try to reinsert it? First, because the muscle protects the flexor tendons from the plate. And second, because the pronator quadratus muscle is a dynamic distal radial joint stabilizing muscle. Indeed, in forearm supination, the pronator quadratus wraps around the ulna like a scarf. This anatomical disposition entails that in forearm supination, while the pronator quadratus muscle contracts, the distal radial joint is compressed. And so the joint is dynamically stabilized. So if we can, we must reset the imperator quadratus muscle. The sixth important anatomical aspect of the distal radius is that, as you can see in this bar chart, mean height of male population differs significantly from one country to another. And the difference can be up to 10 centimeters. Therefore, the size of the radius of the Northern European men will always be greater than the Southern East ones. Equally, we can see that the variance in mean height for females differs from one European country to the other. And in this case, Northern European women can be up to 12 centimeters more than the women from the Eastern countries. To sum up, there is a huge difference between the tallest European man and the shortest European female. This means that in each European country, the distal radius plate width and length should adapt to their population characteristics. This is the end of the radius metaphysis anatomical concepts that I wanted to highlight. I will continue now with some important anatomical aspects of the distal surface architecture, which may also influence our surgical techniques. The distal radius contains three joint surfaces the lunate fossa, the scaphoid one, and the sigmoid, the sigmoid cavity. In all of them, 
the cartilage is thin, it's around one millimeter. The distal radius joint is bigger than the cartilage surfaces as the joint capsule inserts peripherally and transforms the radiocarpal joint in a glenoid cavity that articulates with the carpal condyle constituted by the proximal surface of the scaphoid, the lunate, and the trachea. In the same sense, the distal radio una joint is wider than its cartilage surface that you see here. The cartilage is the, in the, is the thickest in the distal and dorsal aspect of the joint. And this is the most important joint surface area during foreign pronation. Because as you surely all already know, during forearm rotation, the radius rotation is associated with a dorsal volar radius translation. So a joint surface incongruence at the dorsal or the volar distal radial joint rim will always interfere in the forearm pronation, pronospination. It is well known that the usual distal radius inclination is about 23 degrees, but if we pay enough attention, we will see that the lunate fossa is not inclinated. Instead, it is the scaphoid fossa, the one that has all the inclination. And in the same sense, the old worldwide recognizes 10 degrees of dorsal radius tilt. Nevertheless, dorsal tilt is almost null at the lunate facet level, while it is at least 10 degrees at the scaphoid fossa. Another important aspect of the scaphoid fossa is that it is not lined up with the radius axis. It is volarly inclinated. The radial stylot tip is located in the volar aspect of the distal radius joint surface. So, the scaphoid fossa is the distal radius joint surface which leads the most triplanar inclination. We will later see that those inclinations greatly influence the distal radius kinematics. The lunate fossa joint surface is extremely concave, while the scaphoid one is nearly flat. So, the subcontrol screws at the lunate fossa must be inserted quite proximal about the distal tip of the volar rim because of the concavity of the facet. We must never tilt them distally aiming at the dorsal rim to avoid any dorsal aspect of the radiolunate joint invasion. It may even be beneficial to tilt them proximally. In this way, the central surface joint support is guaranteed and the joint invasion is always avoided. Another important aspect to consider during lunate fossa instrumentation is that the sigmoid notch circumference radius is about 15 millimeters. This particular spheric joint configuration implies that most volar distal radial joint rim fractures are difficult to stabilize without risking a screw joint penetration when we insert a standard volar plate. In this case, the C arm perioperative extended tangential view that teach me Dr. Orbai to perform is extremely useful. It's done like that. And nevertheless, in those types of fracture, the ulnar facet 
specific plates are recommended. The scaphoid fossa subchondral screws can be inserted near the distal rim of the radius because the, facet, the fossa is not very concave and can be drilled in a distal inclination because the fossa, the scaphoid fossa is distally inclinated without great risks of entering the joint as the fossa is very, very flat. All these important concepts about the distal radius surface 3D disposition that we have reviewed are the reason why the metaphyseal screws of the volar plates usually have different orientations. The subcontrol distal row ulnar screws are proximally tilted to avoid entering the joint, while the proximal row ulnar screws are distally tilted to stabilize the dorsal radius rim as you see in this picture. On the contrary, at the base of the scaphoid radial facet, the distal row subchondral screws are distally tilted because the fossa is distally tilted and can be freehand inclinated to reach the volar located tip of the stylus, which is volar. while the radio proxima row screw is distally tilted to reach the dorsal radius rim. So everything is uh, thought and we should put all the screws always because they are, uh, they are conceived to reach all the corners of the joint, the distal radius metaphysis. This is the end of the radius bone anatomy concepts that I wanted to highlight. We will continue now with some important anatomical aspects of some ligaments. Three stabilizing ligaments. We should always wonder if those three ligaments are or not intact when we are planning a distal radius fracture treatment. The first ligament is the dorsal radio tracheal ligament, which connects the dorsal rim of the radius lunate fossa with the dorsal aspect of the tracheal. It is one of the two radiocarpal ligaments which hold on the first carpal row and avoid the ulnar carpal translation despite the distal radius inclination. When the wrist is axially loaded, the normal physiologic carpal ulnar translation is limited when this radial tricator ligament is competent. The second ligament, which stabilizes the first carpal row and avoids its ulnar translation under axial load, is the short radial lunate ligament. This ligament connects the volar rim of the radius lunate fossas to the volar aspect of the lunate bone. This ligament is not only important during loading of the wrist. It is also very, very important during wrist mobility. Indeed, it's short. It stabilizes the lunate bone to the radius during flexion extension mobility and allows the mid carpal joint mobility. This mechanically essential ligament inserts in the frag fragile volar rim of the lunate facet that we have seen before. To avoid any future dynamic wrist dysfunction, it is mandatory to find out the system to reduce and stabilize it. We can use specific ulnar facet plates or simple hooks but we must go and fix this little fragment to avoid kinematic and kinetic carpal dysfunctions in the future for the patient. 
This interesting study concludes that ligament bone origins are preserved during distal radius fractures. There is no ligament detachment, but bone ligament detachment. So we always have a fragment of bone to repair. So if we can perform an all joint surface accurate reduction and stabilization and we can allow to restore mechanical radiocarpal stability arthroscopy offers an easy access to the dorsum and the volar lunate fossa distal rind which may allow us to diagnose and treat those bone ligament detachments and improve the functional outcomes of our patients the third structure that I am going to talk about is not really a ligament, but it has many important mechanically, mechanical and proprioceptive properties. The distal radial joint stability primarily depends on the radial and ulnar insertions of the distal radial ligaments, but those ligaments are uh, frequently evolved in these grades of initial distal radius fractures displacement. Nevertheless, the distal radial joint mechanical stability also depends on the integrity of this structure that you are seeing now on your screen. It's a distal oblique bundle of the interosseous membrane. And this structure becomes mechanically incompetent in case of this radial shortening. The third anatomic part that I wanted to talk to you is the distal radius vascular anatomy. It is very, very rich and comes from the volar and the dorsal aspect of the radius. Although the vascular supply through the anterior interosseous artery located in the ulnar aspect of the radius is especially relevant. So aggressive and extended soft tissue dissections should be avoided as much as possible when distal radius plating to avoid vascular bone compromise. As I just introduced, we have started with the distal radius anatomy concepts. Let's move now to the distal radius biomechanics one, the, the, um, and to find out some concepts which will help us to better plan and surgically solve our distal radius fracture patients. We will divide this biomechanical section into distal radius kinematics and distal radius kinetics. How does the distal radius influence the uh, first carpal row mobility and how does the first carpal row mobility influence the radius? Both distal radius forces are different and the joint mobility which occurs in each of them is also different. The articulation between the radius and the lunate is a constrained joint, where the lunate basically performs flexion extension movements. If the joint surface is incongruent, the flexion extension mobility of all the first scalpel row will become restricted or painful. By contrast, the radius scaphoid joint is poorly constricted, allowing scaphoid mobility in the three space plane. Check the video on your right. You see, this is a, a dart throwing motion of the joint, and you see as the scaphoid flexes, extends, uh, volar translates, and inclinates in each um, range of motion, movement. If this joint cartilage is damaged or the fossa is incongruent, the mobility of the first couple row 
will not be greatly damaged as it was in the lunate fossa in Congressy, but early degenerative changes will occur at the radioscaphoid joint because of the high mobility of the radioscaphoid joint. How does the radiocaphoid joint move? When the wrist flexes or extends around the neutral position, the radiocaphoid joint nearly does not move. All wrist mobility is through the mid capital joint. And this, this mid capital joint moves around its axis of mobility, which is called the dart throwing motion plane, and goes from dorsal radial to volo ulnar position. The radio capital motion starts when the wrist goes in full extension or in full flexion. So, a patient with a surgically treated distal radius fracture can initiate early mid carpal joint mobility without interfering at all on the radio carpal joint surface congruence if it performs a wrist flexion extension around the neutral position. The second aspect of the distal radius biomechanics that I would like to comment with you is how does the uh, load transmit across the wrist and if it affects the distal radius, the radiocarpal and the distal radial joints. When a normally aligned radial joint wrist is loaded, Loading forces are proximally transmitted, especially through the radioscaphoid joint. Those forces are then distributed by the interosseous membrane until the elbow. When a misaligned distal radial joint is loaded, loading forces transmission progressively moves to the ulnar cap compartment as much long the ulna is. As you see here in the arrows. Nevertheless, not only the axial wrist loading increases force transmission to the joint surface, wrist mobility also provokes uh, forces. In 2007, Rickley inserted a pressure sensor that you see above. Uh, a, pressure, a pressure sensor device in the radial nocapal joint, and he studied the force transmission and the pressure distribution across the joint under physiologic conditions. In vivo, in radial ulnar deviation and in flexion extension movement. And he realized that during wrist flexion and extension, joint surface forces basically, basically concentrate in the ulnar column of the radiocapal joint and in the dorsal ulnar rim. So the lunate facet and its dorsal rim should always be strongly stabilized in distal radius fractures to allow a safe and early wrist mobilization. He also demonstrated that the distal radius surface joint supports much more great amount of loading forces than expecting during mobility. And that the area of maximum loading during mobility is permanently changing. So the lunate facet must be strongly stabilized, but the others also, because um, during mobility, the forces uh, expand everywhere. At the distal radial joint, Gammon demonstrated that during forearm rotation, the radius and the ulna do not always have the same joint compression zone. Contact and pressure are maximal at 10 degrees of forearm supination, and they are located in this dorsal central area that we have seen before 
had the thickest cartilage. In conclusion, before, when we, when we are in front of uh, this thyroid structure, we must not only check to the X-ray or do the CT scan. We must imagine all the soft tissue and the 3D anatomical requirements, which will facilitate the best outcome. Everything is related. It's not only a flat X-ray. We, so, we sometimes do not need big plates to solve the, the problems. Asoscopy, screws, hooks, and fragment-specific plates can also be very helpful if we can uh, restore the surgical surface anatomy, the metaphysis anatomy, respecting the ligaments and the joint and the capsule, if we think on the stabilizing ligaments, go to check them and repair them if they are avulsed. And uh, with all of that, we would will be able to bring our patient his best kinematics and biomechanics after a strong injury, which is a distal, com a complex distal radio, uh, radius fracture. Thank you very much. Mireya, thank you very much for your talk and for your lecture and for the insights of your thoughts. So um, there are a couple of questions which I would like to take um, to your stage and also to the audience, please feel free if there are more questions to ask them now, we will sort them um, then for you. So Mireya, yes. um, the first question is from the United States. Yeah. There is a question, if it is an option, um, if it is anatomically or biomechanically considerations and concerns that are more easily managed with a patient-specific plate and compared to a standard plate from stock. Um, excuse me, they asked me if the results are better? No, they ask you if it is for you a consideration Yes. Um, to use a patient-specific plate or a patient-specific manufacturer plate instead of a standard plate, and if you have experience with that. Uh, yes, there is a place in that. Um, the, the, the fewer and the shortest are the, the, the surgical approaches, and the less you damage, all the surrounding tissues, the better will, uh, the, will be the outcome if you reduce the, the surgical, the, this, the surface of the joint. So yes, there is a place for fragment-specific plates, and um, and I I have experienced the experience, the normal experience. Thank you very much. So there is another question from a physiotherapy uh, point of view. Should the therapist take any additional precautions when the puke, PQ is sutured? When the PQ is sutured, they should avoid um, full supination of the forearm until the second week, I think. If it has uh, been uh, reinserted. Uh, we try, we always try, and depending on the muscle uh, category, uh, quality, you can or you cannot. Uh, but yes, in full um, supination, you are tightening the suture. I always uh, ask the patient to supinate under pain level. So if he does, does his supination under pain level, I suppose that he's not tightening the suture. 
that's mm -hmm. a good question. Thank you. Um, a question from uh, the UK. Um, please explain the vascular anatomy and how we can avoid damaging it during the approach. Sometimes an ulna approach is indicated for depressed isolation lunate facet fragment. Yes, that's true. That's absolutely true. So uh, if you must go in a lunar approach, you must go in a lunar approach because the the most important thing is to repair the, as as be, the better you can the the bone but if you can manage a little approach or to combine two little approach and respect the interosseous artery member, uh, uh, um, artery it would be better sometimes it's not possible yeah? but yes you can uh, dissect with cautious and to not uh, uh, to avoid putting your uh, hormones uh, and pulling on your artery but yes sometimes you must go through the your do, uh, honor approach and there is uh, another here, here yeah uh, sorry johans here i think that um, miss miss uh, approaches for um, the plate insertion without touching the pronator quadratus I think that this is an intelligent uh, way to plate a radius. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mireya. So there is another question from Spain. Do you always advise an FPL plate for an extra articular distal radius fracture? Sorry, the question is from Zurich, Switzerland. Do you always advise a FPL plate for an extra articular distal radius fracture? I prefer always to insert an FPL plate than a no FPL plate. If I have it, I, I, I can order it, I prefer it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if there is a high emergency fracture of the distal radius and the watershed line is fragmented, do you still plate or prefer using tension bands? Tension bands. I I always plate my plates. My if I consider that a uh, fracture must be surgically repaired, I always plate it, and I always try to plate through a boiler plate. I really um, do not use dorsal plates. I try. Why? To do why, why is your? Why is the diff, Why is it for you always um, the step number one to use a volar plate instead of a dorsal plate in specific fragments? Yeah. Because the the tendon ex, the extensor tendons um, are always in risk with the dorsal plates, and uh, you must always take out the plates uh, after the consolidation. And um, I think that I can manage the fractures from the volar approach. And sometimes what I do is a little approach to uh, put a pleistotome or. A, a device inside to help me to reduce what I played from the floor. So there is the question from another physiotherapist. If there should be any precautions for um, a bryoradialis shortening? Ah, no. No. Bryoradialis, uh, when um, a fracture with a stylot, a radial stylot mm, shortening, an important radial shortening, uh, uh, shortening. Um, and you cannot reduce it, okay? You must do a, um, a brachioradialis tendon, distal tendon lengthening. Uh, we usually do a zeta plasty. And um, we do not um, we do not suture it. Why? Because um, the zeta plasty will uh, heal uh, comfortably without any suture. Uh, there is no. Uh, I have I haven't found any uh, any articles that um, relates the brachioradialis tenotomy, distal tenotomy with bad functional results, they, it always uh, heal. Okay. 
So another question from Spain or from Italy. Um, do you think the removal of the hardware, so the plates or the screws, is necessary? I recommend it in young patients which want to do risky activities. If they like motorbiking, if they like climbing, if they like uh, snowboarding, I recommend it to them because uh, the bone is uh, less resistant than the plate and I don't want to face to a periplate fracture in, uh, in their uh, risky activities. And there is another question about an arthroscopic support. So do you use the arthroscopic support frequently in your radial surgeries? In the distal radius surgery? I always use my arthroscopic support. It, I think it's the, the most interesting uh, step up for the radius uh, treatment. It brings you the possibility to check if you have screws inside. Check your 30, uh, 360 around all your distal radius surface. Check if there are um, non-fresh uh, damages that were there before. And check if there are soft tissue damages or on the radiocarpal or on the metacarpal joint that can make your post-operative uh, protocol change. I am not saying that I repair all what I see. I always repair if I find a, a TFCC fovea detachment. All the other uh, lesions, I, in most cases, I do not do nothing, but I know they are there and I know how to post-operative control my patient. And if in three months or four months, he has some complaints, and I think that they can be related to something that I saw, it's better than to ask uh, what happens with this poor patient. That's and my- Do you opinion. also, so Mireya, just to be clear, you also use it in extra-articular cases, not only yes. in intra-articular cases, also in extra-articular cases, you see the benefit of it. It's 10 minutes. If you, if you find nothing, it's 10 minutes. If you find oh. something, it's 20 minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Thank and you. And you see, and you know what there is inside. Mm -hmm. So there is the question about casting. So post-operative treatment. What do you think about a short cast versus a long cast to eventually prevent prosupination in distal radius fractures? If there is no fovea detachment, I do not uh, limit uh, the pronosopination, never. If, if the stabilizing system is stable, eh? if, uh, if the bone was soft and uh, the screws didn't uh, get uh, strong, I, 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 I will be more, more cautious. But if it's a normal bone, my device is strong and the fovea of the TFCC is okay, I put a soft dressing, a soft dressing for two two weeks while they are uh, starting to move fingers, uh, elbow and shoulder. And when I remove the stitches and the soft bone, I put them, I ask them to put a removal uh, orthosis to start with mid couple joint movement, with this uh, inclination and with pronosopination under the pain level and when i see them one or two weeks after if they are not painful and it's not swollen and the, the it, he goes okay he starts with full range of motion always under his pain level mm -hmm. okay and there is another question. How frequently do you see ruptures of the long and short radiolunate ligament as well as radioscaphocapate ligament? Do you repair them? Short radiolunate ligament is very 
frequent mm, bony detached, and I always repair it. Dorsal radiotracheal bone avulsions are frequently not a, a detachment like that, but it it opens like a book. And in this case, if when I touch with my arthroscope hook, I am not able to absolutely detach. I do not treat it, and I, I I do not insert any devices to take it because I think that it will heal because it's an open book uh, fracture. Lun a short radiolunate when it's ruptured, you must stabilize it. There is another question. Um, if there are consequences after distal radius fracture, also for the lack of extension of the fingers, PIP, DIP, and MCP movement, and also a consequence to less strength in flexion of the wrist and also of the fingers. Does the radi distal radius fracture affect the movement, the range of motion in the fingers, or from your experience only in the wrist? No. As I, I have said, sometimes screws invade the sheets. Sometimes um, the, the extensor sheets. Sometimes um, it's not here that the screws invade, but uh, the screws are long in the diaphysis. And all these can interfere with uh, extensor tendons uh, gliding. And these um, can. Um, also um, have functional disturbances in flexions of metacarpal and interphalangeal. And the other thing that also um, that I think um, fingers also can be functionally um, decreased if there is a carpal tunnel syndrome or because of the surgery, or in the cases that have not been operated. I think that most of the hand problems of the distal radius fractures, which has have not been operated, are a median nerve compression because of the hematoma or the fracture in the pronator quadratus and above. So yes, uh, wrist uh, fractures not only damage wrist function, but also finger functions. Okay. And then uh, the last question here, in complex distal radius fracture cases associated with a distal ulna fracture, how would you fix a fracture like this? And when do you start movement of those patients? Plate and plate, and it and movement depends on the solidity of uh, the of the your plating, distal mm. ulna plate and proxim and distal radius plate. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I I hope he asked me that. If he asked me yeah. for the uh, ulnar stylot, it depends on the uh, feeling of the distal radial joint. I, I don't what know. What about ulnar styloid fractures? Do you sometimes also try to repel them or do you just leave them? Um, if they are associated to a uh, distal radial joint laxity, I reinsert the TFCC, not the bone. I go directly to do two tunnels through the ulna to catch and tighten the TFCC, which is the real problem of the of the ulnar styloid fracture. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then one last question about the carpal tunnel release. Do you perform them usually? I ask the patient if uh, sometimes the patient I, I I give him to the operating room in the third day or the fourth day. I ask him if by if since the fracture he had uh, had problems with his uh, median nerve during those three, four days. If he tells me numbness, dysesthesia, I always open the, the carpal tunnel, yes. Okay. But only if, and, and, 
and sometimes if they have had previous carpal tunnel symptomatology, I also open them because I think that the um, and uh, the, the trauma um, can uh, damage his previous carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay, Mireya, thank you very much for your lecture and also for answering all the questions. Thank you. Um, it has been excellent. And um, before you leave, I would like to quickly um, ask the audience for um, two minutes of more attention. So um, we have started um, this bulk webucation series and we are continuing. So um, we have started today with part one of distal radius fracture management and we will cover part two on the 16th of June from Professor Meyer from Germany Saarbrücken. So this will be the part two of our distal radius fracture management series. And already next week, we will continue with our upcoming bulk webucation events with um, Dr. Phil Grief from Dublin in Ireland. He will talk about metacarpal and fr uh, phalangeal fracture management in complex cases, tips, tricks, and traps. Then the week after, we will continue with Stefan Schindele from Zurich, Switzerland, and Peter Axelsson from Gothenburg, Sweden, about a session for, of 3D planning and patient-specific implants, part one, about extra-articular radius reconstruction, and also 3D planning in general in hand surgery will be covered by those two surgeons. And followed the week after with a session from Neil Shep and Rade Keberle from the Czech Republic and from the Netherlands about 3D planning and patient-specific implants part two in intra-articular radius reconstruction cases. They will show case series of very complex intra-articular cases which they have reconstructed under the support of 3D planning and patient-specific implants. We will continue our build webication events after those events I just introduced you, but um, they will be announced via our build webpage and also via our social media channels. And also you can register for a Berg newsletter. So I would like to invite you to follow us on those social media channels, follow us uh, under Bill Group, and also visit our webpage with uh, www.billgroup.com. Please follow us there and see the webpage and the social media channels for more information. So, Mireya, thank you one more time. It was a pleasure to be on the stage with you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for spending the evening with us. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming and see you another day. Okay. And as we said already, the sessions will be uploaded on the YouTube channel of Mireya and on our build webpage. Great. Have a nice evening. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs>